When it comes to air quality, the bad news is that wildfires and air pollution have really degraded the quality of our air. But the good news is that we're all realizing that the quality of our air, and particularly the quality of our indoor air, is really darn important. I'm so excited to tell you about Puro Air because in 30 minutes, this device will remove allergens, dust, smoke, and gases from your room. It uses a stronger type of filter called a HEPA-14, and it filters pollutants at a microscopic level. I keep my Puro Air running upstairs where the bedrooms are all night. I love that it's quiet. Cleaner air just hits different, doesn't it? Check out everything Puro Air has to offer at getpuroair.com. That's G-E-T-P-U-R-O-A-I-R.com. One more time for the people in the back, getpuroair.com. Hello, my friends, and welcome back. My name is Stephanie Safarian, and you're listening to episode 445 of Sustainable Minimalists. This is a show about intentional, eco-friendly minimalist living. And today's show, once and for all, we are outlining smart ways to purchase fish and seafood. Now, I, of course, before we go any further, need to mention at the outset that not eating seafood, not killing the animal is, of course, the best choice from an environmental standpoint and, of course, also from an ethical standpoint. That said, even the most intentional among us buy seafood at least occasionally, and so this episode is for all of us. And as the global demand for seafood continues to rise, thanks to population growth, thanks to rising incomes, so also do the many issues that plague the industry. And there are issues. We're going to get to them today. We hear a lot about the negative effects of industrial animal agriculture, industrial farming, let's say, on our planet. But when we talk about industrial farming, we're often discussing cows, pigs. And so these conversations are almost always focused on animals for livestock. If seafood seems to have an eco-friendly halo around it in your mind, that myth will be busted today. I, and I used to, frankly, have that idea that, oh, well, fish is eco-friendly. If you're going to eat something, maybe a fish is better than a chicken, let's say. That is due to an educational blind spot, and we are going to fix that for me and maybe you as well today. Now, I want to say, too, this is a very comprehensive episode, so get out your paper and pen to take notes, <laughs> buckle up, sit down, get comfy. We have a three-part show today. In part one, we're talking wild caught. We have this vision of a little red boat and a jolly captain with a hat and a white beard. <laughs> this is a far cry from reality. That's a far cry from wild caught fishing. That's a far cry from what's really happening in our ocean. So we'll get to that in part one. Part two is all about farmed fish. 50% of the world's seafood these days is coming from fish farms. Are fishing farms the answer? I mean, we're not taking fish out of ocean ecosystems. Is that the answer? Well, spoiler alert, no, they, that is not the answer, but that's part two. And then in part three, I have six suggestions for being a conscious fish and seafood consumer. I'll also say here too, if you were wondering, if you had to guess, what do you think the most popular species of fish and seafood are here in America? What do we just go nuts for? If you said salmon, you would have gotten the second most popular seafood here in the U.S. Salmon comes in at the number two spot. The average American consumes more than three pounds of salmon a year. And the number one spot is, of course, shrimp. Shrimp has an average annual consumption reaching nearly six pounds per person. And so if you hear me talking a little bit extra about salmon and shrimp today, I'm doing that intentionally simply because they're more popular. We're eating them more. So let's talk about them a little more. Now let's get right into part one. We're talking about the wild caught fish. Well, I already alluded to it, but fishing is not a cute little red boat with a jolly little captain. Fishing in 2024 has become industrialized keyword industrialized. It is also oversized. I'm talking huge boats, gigantic trawlers with the singular purpose of ladling out of the ocean 
hundreds and hundreds of animals per catch. It is the industrialization of fishing that's the problem. And such industrialization without regard to consequences is due to the fact, of course, you know it, that the seafood industry is ridiculously lucrative. We human beings, so many of us, tend to forego ethics, tend to forego long-term thinking when profits are dangling in our face. A bluefin tuna, so one bluefin tuna, gigantic fish, can sell for $3 million. And that is why, my friends, that less than 3% of bluefin tuna remain in our oceans. It's thanks to profit-driven overfishing. And yes, the bluefin tuna population is in danger of collapse. And so that brings me to the first issue associated with wild-caught fish, and that is, of course, that the industrialization of wild-caught fishing is destroying ocean ecosystems. And so we'll table that for one hot minute, and I'll just say, if you are a fisherman with your little boat and your pole. My husband loves to fish. I'm not talking about that type of fishing here. I'm talking about the gigantic trawlers on the ocean. There's very little regulation. Nobody really knows what's going on on those boats. That's what I'm discussing here. I read a statistic. Five million fish are killed every minute. And so we know about deforestation on land, right? When we take too many fish from the ocean, and we are, by the way, because of human demand for seafood, when we take too many fish from the ocean, we are essentially deforesting the ocean. Let's talk about the shark fin industry for a minute. Shark fin soup, maybe you've heard of it. It's wildly popular in Asia. Hong Kong is known as Shark Fin City. They cut the shark fin off the shark. One single bowl of this soup goes for $100. One bowl, $100 for a bowl of soup. This soup has very little, if any, nutritional value. Well, yes, just like the bluefin tuna, shark populations are also crashing, and sharks are at the top of the food chain. So when sharks die, other species die with them, and we're killing 11,000-ish sharks per hour. 50 million sharks, so aside from the shark fin soup, 50 million sharks are killed every year as bycatch. Bycatch, if you don't know what bycatch is, it's when that big, gigantic net goes out to sea and catches whatever it can catch (laughs) and then reels it in. 50 million sharks are killed that way every year alone when they're not even looking for sharks. 50 million. I've heard it said before that if you want to address climate change, the first thing you have to do is protect the ocean by leaving it alone. Dr. Sylvia Earle, famed oceanographer, Dr. Sylvia Earle, she came on this show. I was so fortunate to interview her, one of the best podcasting moments I've ever had. Uh, This was her point. And by the way, if you did not listen to that episode with famed oceanographer Sylvia Earle, also National Geographic's Explorer at Large. I will link to it in the show notes. It is a must listen because if you don't understand why healthy oceans are essential for life on Earth, our life, our life on Earth, human beings' existence on Earth, I have to direct you to that episode and other episodes where I've already covered this topic. Again, linked in the show notes because I just don't have the time to do that today, to explain all of that today. But take my word for it and take Dr. Sylvia Earle's word for it when I say that our oceans are extremely delicate ecosystems. And when we mess with those ecosystems by ladling out gigantic amounts of fish, we're messing with the food chain, yes, but we're also messing with our fate as well. Now, scientists and marine biologists, much smarter than me, they argue that our oceans are at a turning point. I've heard it say that our oceans may be empty of fish by 2048. That number has largely been debunked. But the point here is that less than 1% of our oceans are being regulated. So if you think, oh, there are international bodies watching the waters, good Samaritans making sure that fishermen and fisherwomen are fisher people are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Less than 1% of our oceans are regulated. And by and large, no one's watching what these fishing vessels are doing out at sea. Nobody knows what they're catching, how much they're catching, whether they're following the rules. And guess what? 
as we watch species numbers drastically plummet, they're likely not following the rules. So that's problem number one with wild caught fish. You're standing at the fish counter. Ooh, there's salmon. There's farmed salmon, wild caught. Which one's more ethical? Which one should I purchase? We're just talking about wild caught right now. Another issue with wild caught anything is, again, these gigantic fishing vessels out to sea, they are a major contributor to the plastic pollution crisis. You already know it. Our oceans have become big, toxic plastic soup. There's a great Pacific garbage patch filled with plastic trash. And yet, have you ever wondered what makes up the majority of the plastic in the ocean? Social media would have you say that it's plastic straws or our plastic bags or these plastic items that consumers use here and there. And it's our fault. It's the consumer's fault. But that's not accurate. 46%, 46%, so nearly the majority of ocean trash is fishing nets and fishing gear. I'm talking ropes, crates, buoys, nets. 46% of the trash in the ocean is fishing related. (laughs) So why are we lamenting over plastic straws and plastic bags in the ocean when 46% of the trash in the ocean is plastic nets and other fishing gear? By the way, those plastic nets and crates and buoys, and especially the nets, they are extra bad for ocean wildlife, are they not? They're designed to trap things. Plastic straws, by contrast, they account for 0.03% of trash in the ocean. So I remember maybe 10 years ago, there was that ban plastic straws, save the sea turtles, save the oceans. I mean, uh, sure, should we be using plastic straws when there are other alternatives? For the majority of us able-bodied people, the answer is no. However, the plastic straw problem in comparison to the fishing nets and fishing gear problem is minuscule. 0.03% of everything in the ocean is plastic straws. 46% of everything in the ocean that's not supposed to be there is fishing stuff. So if you want to tackle the plastic pollution crisis, not eating wild-caught fish is a really smart way to do so, not supporting the industry that's polluting our oceans. And then finally, perhaps the biggest problem of all, we're not going to talk about it much because it's outside the confines of this show. But the third and final issue with wild-caught fish that I want to just mention today, and if you're interested in learning more, I definitely suggest you do some research on the topic, but the issue is slave labor. Slave labor has indeed been documented on fishing vessels in Asia. They need manpower to work these boats, and they get that manpower from slavery. So whew, so lots of issues associated with wild-caught fish. We've got, of course, destroying the ocean ecosystems. We have the plastic pollution problem, and we also have slave labor. Surely farmed fish is better, right? Surely farmed fish is the solution to our overfishing issues. We want it to be the case. However, it is not. We're going to take our sponsor break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about farmed fish and seafood. I'll see you in a minute. You trust your water filter pitcher to make your tap water safe to drink, but is it really doing anything? Most filters just can't remove gross contaminants like bacteria and parasites and PFAS and microplastics. I could go on and on. I trust my water filter pitcher for water that's safe for my family to drink, and if the brand I bought isn't doing what it advertised to do, that makes me feel so frustrated. Enter LifeStraw Home. LifeStraw Home is the kitchen upgrade you will wish you made years ago. It's the only water pitcher that filters out over 30 contaminants. Most importantly, LifeStraw fights for the planet and gives back. It's a glass pitcher, and for every one sold, a child in need receives a year of safe water. Better filtration, better taste, better design. LifeStraw Home products can be found at LifeStraw.com or Amazon. 
Are you looking for that perfect gift for someone special this Valentine's Day? Are you perhaps going out on a big Valentine's date and you're looking for that outfit? Whatever you're doing this Valentine's Day, Quince has you covered with luxury essentials at affordable prices. Quince offers a range of high-quality items. The prices are within reach, like 100% Mongolian cashmere sweaters from $50. Yes, I have one. It is my favorite sweater in my closet. And yes, Quince partners directly with top factories, and so they're cutting out the cost of the middlemen. And even better, Quince only works with factories that use safe and ethical and responsible manufacturing practices. Give yourself or others the gift of luxury this Valentine's Day with Quince. Go to quince.com slash sustainable podcast for free shipping on your order and 365 day returns. Quince.com slash sustainable podcast. Listeners, if you're like me, you are committed to living a greener and simpler life. If that sounds like you, I would love to introduce you to Home Threads. Home Threads is your ally because it is a total destination for decor and furniture. HomeThreads.com helps you discover furniture that not only complements your minimalist lifestyle, but also respects the planet. You can find thoughtfully crafted pieces that use sustainable materials without compromising on style. I have an outdoor bench from Home Threads, and I love that it's made of acacia wood. It is sturdy. It is strong. It's meant to last. And more importantly, it's made with renewable materials, no synthetics to be found here. Create a home that reflects your commitment to the environment. Visit homethreads.com slash sustainable for 15% off your first order. Home Threads, love where you live. And we're back. Before the break, we discussed three issues associated with wild-caught fish. Now we're going to go on to farmed fish. I mentioned earlier that 50% of the world's seafood is coming from fishing farms. Fishing farms are also known as aqua farms. They often take the shape of mesh cages submerged in natural bodies of water. They can also be concrete enclosures on land. For salmon, at least, there are both ocean farms and there are land-based farms. Commonly farmed species include salmon, of course, tuna, cod, trout, halibut. In the case of tuna, I believe that the tuna are first wild-caught, so caught in the wild, And then they're introduced to a farm and they're kept there to fatten them up before they're slaughtered for our sushi. (laughs) Now, according to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, roughly 32% of world fish stocks are overexploited, depleted, or recovering and are urgently in need of being rebuilt. And so, at least at first glance, Farmed fish sounds like the answer, right? Let's leave the wild fish populations alone and let's just farm fish instead. Well, let's talk about salmon for a minute. About 99% of the world's salmon farming takes place in open net pens, which allows water to flow between the farm, so the enclosure, and the natural marine environment. And this free exchange of water is the problem. It's the heart of many of the farmed fish industry's issues. It is worsened. These issues are worsened by severe overcrowding that pollutes the surrounding marine ecosystem. We're polluting the ocean with excrement, with feces in particular, and we're promoting the spread of diseases and pests like sea lice, for example. We'll talk about sea lice in a minute. But when a fish population in a fish farm gets sea lice, you have to treat them with antibiotics and other pesticides, which then literally get passed down onto the consumer. Now, authors Douglas France and Catherine Collins in their book that came out in 2022, it was titled Salmon Wars, The Dark Underbelly of Your Favorite Fish. They compare fishing farms to factory farms. So the factory farms of cows, chickens, pigs, they said, and I quote in their book, 
most salmon farms are like floating feedlots. So think about the problems that you know exist in factory farming and now take those problems and put them in your picture of a fish farm. So problem number one is the fish in the fish farm can escape. When many fish escape at once or some escape consistently like a slow drip, these farmed fish have significant impacts on the local ecosystem. Sometimes fish are farmed in areas they're not native to, so they're disrupting the natural ecosystem when they're introduced by escaping. If they can escape and establish themselves, they may compete with native species for resources. In 2017, at least 250,000 fish from a fish farm in Puget Sound escaped. By the way, 250,000 fish. So we're not talking about a fish here or there. We're talking about a quarter of a million fish. When it comes to salmon, there is a real threat that escaped farmed salmon will interbreed with the endangered, keyword endangered, local wild Atlantic salmon. And studies have shown that the spawn of interbred fish have a compromised ability to survive in the wild. So the wild Atlantic salmon is already endangered. It's interbreeding with a farmed variety and the babies, the spawn, is going to have a compromised ability to survive. What does that mean for this endangered species? Escaped fish from farms can also severely damage ecosystems. They introduce disease and pollutants. So that's problem number one with farmed fish. Problem number two with farmed fish is it is very often a disgusting practice. As in the case with animals on land, industrial farms on land, these fish are often housed in unnaturally crowded and cramped conditions, little if any room to move. Fish often suffer from lesions, fin damage. These overcrowded conditions are stressful and promote disease and parasite outbreaks. Let's talk about those sea lice for a minute. Yes, the farmers treat them with pesticides and antibiotics. When they use antibiotics, yes, we may very likely be creating drug-resistant strains of diseases that harm wildlife populations and us and the humans that are buying the fish and eating the farmed fish. These fish are really confined to pens. They're swimming in their own filth. And by the way, what do farmed fish eat? Farmed fish eat fish meal, which essentially is a mix, a blend of fish oil and fish meal. So they're eating other fish. Where are they getting these other fish to create the fish meal? They're wild catching them. So farmed fishing, you could make the argument that it's just wild caught fishing in disguise. Now, not so fun fact about your farmed salmon. Farmed salmon is not pink. It is gray. And so farmed salmon has color added to it to make it look pink. Think about that the next time you're standing over the seafood counter. That farmed salmon is actually gray and has color pumped into it to make it look pink. Gross. Farmed fishing can be very darn wasteful. 50-ish percent of farmed fish die from anemia, sea lice infestations, which, by the way, is fish getting eaten alive by parasites. But anyway, chlamydia, other infectious diseases. So if you're farming 100 fish, 50 of them are likely going to die from all those infectious diseases and parasites and more. So the argument can be made that farm fishing is incredibly wasteful. Now, you may be wondering, which is healthier? Okay, I hear all that. But for me, from a human health perspective, which is healthier, farmed or wild caught? Because wild-caught fish are not confined to a small space and they're not fed a diet of processed food, wild-caught fish can sometimes be healthier than farm-raised. And that's really due to the fact that wild-caught fish have a more natural and diverse diet of plankton, algae, and other aquatic plants. Fish from the wild also tend to be slightly lower in saturated fat than farm-raised fish. Farm-raised fish, however, can be higher in omega-3 fatty acids, yet some farm-raised varieties can be higher in contaminants. Now, what about shrimp, America's number one favorite seafood? Here in the U.S., we 
import 90% of our shrimp from Asia. Most of that shrimp is coming from shrimp farms. They are raised in high concentrations. They also, shrimp naturally do, they have underdeveloped immune systems. And so high concentrations with underdeveloped immune systems, that is the recipe for disease. To prevent and control disease, farms use chemicals. Those chemicals end up in waterways, yes, but they also end up in the shrimp. And some of these chemicals, I'm specifically talking about antibiotics, they can be deleterious to human health. In 2015, Consumer Reports released a special report on shrimp after testing 348 packages of frozen shrimp from various grocery stores in the U.S. Guess what they found? 11 of them tested positive for one or more antibiotics. They also found MRSA, which is that antibiotic-resistant strain on shrimp. So after knowing all this, what on earth is sustainable seafood? Sustainable seafood. I'm going to say it's an oxymoron. But Technically, the technical definition is this. Environmentally sustainable seafood is wild or farmed seafood that's harvested in ways that don't harm the environment, doesn't harm other wildlife, and helps to ensure healthy and resilient ocean ecosystems. For wild-caught seafood in particular, it means that the population is well-managed, it's not overfished, and fishing gear has minimal impact on natural wildlife and the habitat in general. For farmed fish, sustainable seafood is fish that comes from a fish farm with solid practices in place that minimize their impacts on the environment while also limiting habitat damage and escaped fish and more. Now, all that said, all of that said, global fish populations are on the verge of collapse. And so you can make the case. Heck, I'm making the case that there is no such thing as sustainable fishing. There's no such thing as sustainable fisheries. I know this is an unpopular opinion, and for the seafood lovers, I'm sure this is not an opinion you want to hear, but it is indeed rooted in reality. Any organization that tells you to just buy sustainable seafood is exploiting the problem. Now, I was fortunate, again, to have Dr. Sylvia Earle on the show. Again, that episode is a must-listen. It's linked in the show notes if you missed it. But Dr. Earle also said there is no such thing as sustainable seafood. We need to stop eating seafood to let our oceans replenish themselves, and we need to stop eating it yesterday. And so now we're moving on to our six tips for buying seafood better. I mean... Of course, if you want an A-plus in (laughs) the Sustainable Minimalist Seafood course that we're taking today, of course, you're never going to buy seafood again, but I know that that's quite unrealistic for so many of us. So I have six tips for you. The first one, of course, is to reduce or completely eliminate your fish consumption. Again, it's not a popular tip, but it is the best choice. So if you eat a lot of seafood, ask yourself, can you eat a little bit less? If you don't eat much at all, but sometimes, ask yourself, can you commit to eating seafood only on special occasions? That's tip one. And I really want you to sit with it. Can you eat less? Can you eat less? Tip number two. This is an interesting one. Usually on this show, I tell you when you're buying something, anything, to trust third-party certifications. I say it all the time until I'm blue in the face, don't I? Well, in the case of fish and seafood, I'm telling you not to trust third-party certification. So those little labels on the package, don't trust them. And of course, don't trust those greenwashing terms, eco-friendly, sustainable, responsible. Those are all greenwashing and mean absolutely nothing. They're unregulated. They're self-declared by the brand. They're a joke. And then, of course, when it comes to the certified labels, I'm thinking Dolphin Safe or MSC, Marine Stewardship Council Certified, right? We think, oh, this is the product to buy. We need to mention here that the fishing industry is ridiculously corrupt. 
And I would direct you to the documentary. It's on Netflix now. It's called Seaspiracy, if you're interested in learning more about this. But in the documentary, they prove the point that these third-party certifications, these labels, they often obscure what's happening at sea. And so in the case of fish and seafood, I say here and now, don't trust the certifications. And again, I direct you to Seaspiracy for more information on that. Tip number three. And this is the big one. Get help. Use a sustainable seafood guide. There are many of them. And you might be thinking to yourself, oh, Stephanie, just tell me, do I buy salmon or do I buy halibut? (laughs) I can't answer that question. It's impossible to say buy wild-caught salmon and farm-raised halibut always. I can't say that. And that's because what's sustainable in your part of the country and your part of the world is very different from what's sustainable in mine. And also, let's not forget, these populations are always in flux, right? That's why you need an up-to-date guide. Listener Katie wrote to me a couple months ago. Hi, Katie. And she introduced me to the Monterey Bay Aquarium's Seafood Watch app. It's no longer an app. I'll get to that in a minute. But seafoodwatch.org uses scientific data from the Monterey Bay Aquarium and relies on a team of 20-ish scientists who weigh factors like fish population, harm to habitat, harm to other species, management practices, and more to determine whether a fishery is sustainable. Now, they also have printable guides for your specific location in the U.S. as to what species are the best choice for you. You can print them out and just put them in your purse. But the Seafood Watch app is no longer supported. And so if you have it on your phone, they're not updating the data. You can delete it, but you can just go to their website and like home screen the page and create an app, at least on your iPhone, they're updating the website. So how does this work in real life? Okay, so you you have seafoodwatch.org up on your phone, you're about to buy fish. How does this work? Well, I went to the Whole Foods website, and I clicked on the what's on sale this week tab. I generally, if I'm going to buy seafood, it's always what's on sale. (laughs) I'm pretty frugal. I don't buy, (laughs) I buy what's on sale. Uh, So, okay. So I went to Whole Foods website, what's on sale at my store. This week at Whole Foods on sale for fish is Atlantic cod and swordfish. Those two fish are on sale. So let's take the Atlantic cod example first. First of all, there's no information on either of these species online. It just says Atlantic cod and it just says swordfish. It doesn't give me any more information and than that farm or wild caught. <laughs> it doesn't tell me anything. Uh, just the name. So I go to seafoodwatch.org. I type in, let's take Atlantic cod first. The app told me that Atlantic cod would be a good choice, a green choice, but only if I can confirm that it was caught with a pole in line in the United States or in the Gulf of Maine. I can't confirm that (laughs) because there's no information online. The website also tells me to avoid all other Atlantic cod in the United States and Canada because Atlantic cod populations are completely depleted. So I can't confirm that it was caught with a pole in line. And so I ethically cannot buy the Atlantic cod. Now let's chat about the swordfish. On seafoodwatch.org, click on swordfish. Swordfish is rated a best choice by Seafood Watch and is the most environmentally sustainable option because it comes from a healthy population. Full stop. So if there are only two things on sale, Atlantic cod and swordfish, this website makes my choice quite clear. It's swordfish. So that's my tip number three. Use a guide. It is absolutely impossible for the average consumer to know what is the most sustainable choice at the seafood counter without a guide. Monterey Bay Aquarium's seafoodwatch.org is one such guide. There are indeed others, but that's the one I'm recommending today. Tip number four is when you're out at a restaurant, you need to ask for more information about what's on your menu. So you see... You know, you're at a nice restaurant. It says 
salmon with a maple glaze or whatever. I don't know. Maple glaze. That sounds gross. Uh, salmon with a honey vinaigrette reduction. That also sounds gross. I don't know. Salmon on the menu. <laughs> Usually there's not much more information on the menu, right? So you have to ask. You have to use your voice and ask your waiter, well, where did this fish come from? Can you give me more information about the fish you're serving tonight? 95% of the time, the waiter or waitress is going to have no idea. But you still have to ask. And if they can't give you any more information and you can't then go to seafoodwatch.org on your phone to find out more, then my suggestion is you don't order it. You just don't order it. But the tip here is to get in the habit of asking for more information about the fish that's on the menu. And if you can't get any more information, that is a big fat red flag. Tip number five, I mentioned it on headlines last Friday, but remember, seafood fraud is a thing. The Washington Post just last week reported that seafood fraud is on the rise. You might not be getting the fish you paid for. Studies estimate that anywhere between 16 to 75 percent of seafood sold in the United States is mislabeled. That means you're looking at a white fish. You think it's trout, but it's cod let's say. Now, certain types of seafood are more at risk for fraud. Whitefish is really difficult to tell apart. Red snapper, mahi-mahi, blue crab, and Atlantic cod, they are particularly vulnerable to illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing and fraud. And so if you're not getting the full value of what you paid for, if you think you're getting one thing and you're getting a lower value substitute, uh, that would make me quite frustrated and angry. (laughs) And so when you're standing at the fish counter, you need to ask the person behind the counter, what's the species? If it doesn't say it on the card, you need to ask. You should know the scientific name of the seafood you're buying, okay? Not just rockfish. (laughs) Rockfish could be any number of species. You should also ask too, where does it come from? If the tag doesn't say, ask. At the very least, they should be able to tell you what country the fish or seafood came from. So tip number five is to know that seafood fraud is a thing. Up to 75% of seafood is mislabeled, 75%. So be ready and willing and able to use your voice at the counter. Tip number six, buy locally sourced. The seafood industry as a whole leaves a big fat carbon footprint due to transportation, Boats, planes, delivery trucks. There's also the processing, packaging, refrigeration. So if you are in the habit of buying locally sourced fish, fish that was caught near you, you will at the very least be saving on the carbon costs associated with that fish. Now, I know that this tip only works for those of us close to coasts. (laughs) My Midwesterners, this may not work for you unless, of course, you're eating fish from the Great Lakes, perhaps, but buy locally sourced fish when possible. And my final word for you today to wrap up this long-ish episode, of course, is to make eating seafood a treat again. It is crucial that each and every one of us diversify our seafood consumption, so eat different things, and eating less seafood overall. Less seafood overall. That's the conscious consumer action that I really want to drill home today. I'm on vacation. I know it doesn't seem like it because I'm still podcasting, (laughs) but we will not have held nines tomorrow due to the fact that I would like to spend time with my family. I will be back on Tuesday for our regularly scheduled interview. As always, if you need me, reach out. I so hope I taught you something today. I so hope you learned something. I so hope I gave you a tangible tip that you can enact in your daily life starting right now. If I did any of that, please let me know. You can email me. You can leave me a review, which I will read and which will help the show grow. Thank you so much. I'll see you Tuesday. Have a great weekend and take care.